Q&A time. Post your questions down below and let's begin. Can you build a great chest with a strong touch and go bench? Yes. Imagine you could do four or five touch and go and you never did a pause rep in your entire life. You think you're not going to have watermelon pecs? Come on. They're going to be massive, bro. If you get strong, you're going to get huge. Simple as that. And the thing is, touch and go will automatically raise your pause, which is something that guys don't talk about. When you pause bench, you're still the stretch reflex. So the carryover is still there. It may not be the most specific thing. There is a skill element, obviously. And I think that we could agree to a certain extent that the pause bench might be superior to pet development. You're re-exploding off a quote-unquote more dead stop, right? There's obviously less momentum going on. So we can say maybe a little bit less anterior delt and try, a bit more pec, you know, if we want to quantify it like that. But ultimately, when you bench, you can't take out the prime movers. And your chest is going to get huge. Think about a way to dip. Are you doing pause reps on that? Usually no. What about a way to push up? Same thing. What about your dumbbell bench? Some guys do exclusively dumbbells. They get a huge chest. But they're not pausing. What about all the bodybuilders? I don't want to hear the argument that, oh, they're on steroids. Most natural bodybuilders as well. Even some of the old school guys didn't do pause bench. They did touch and go. And what if you're doing a soft touch and go, right? You know, you, you don't have to do pause. Do I recommend it? Absolutely. Is that how I train? Mostly, yeah. I like doing pause, pin pressing, and touch and go too. So to me, why not just do it all? But if you were to stick to only one style, like touch and go, your pecs would still get huge. And that's a fact. And don't let the biased guys tell you otherwise. It may be a rule in powerlifting that you have to pause. That's just for competition. For bodybuilding, touch and go works fine. Although I do recommend pausing because I think you'll get a little bit better pec gains. Especially if you're struggling in that area. How do you recommend to deadlift for concurrent? That's up to you, my man. You have a volume day, an intensity day. You choose the variations. Personally, I like doing pulls off the floor on the intensity workouts. And then block pulls for volume. I find it's the perfect blend and it just makes sense from a recovery standpoint as well as carryover. So I'll give you an example. Intensity day. Week one, standard deadlift. Week two, deficit deadlift. Week three, maybe a stiff leg. And week four, you could do maybe a trap bar deadlift, low handles. And then for your volume workouts, maybe you can do progressive range of motion, five by five. Or you do five by five off the same height, but you change the styles. So you do standard one week, snatch grip the next. And then maybe high handle trap bar as well. Spreads the lower back a little bit. You get some overload, upper back and traps. Still gives you great carryover, you know. You're throwing some RDLs in there too on your volume workouts. Like, there's so many different approaches. What you have to do is identify what do you want? What are your weaknesses? As long as you're managing volume intensity the proper way and you rotate specific variations that give you carryover, you're good. But if you don't care about carryover, bodybuilding is your objective, then it doesn't really matter what variations you do for the most part, you know? But in my opinion, pull off the floor once a week, then do block pulls another day. Or do speed pulls. You can do three-week waves, you know? Really, whatever you want, man. Concurrent is extremely flexible. Hey, Alex, if I can recover better and progress faster with a box squat instead of a traditional full acid grass back squat, should I continue with the box squat even if I'm approaching intermediate phase? Yeah, why not? You can do box squats exclusively if you choose. You don't have to do a regular free squat. Hell, my novice program has to do box squats. I think they're generally better in many cases for athletics and all kinds of stuff like that. Check out my Q&A that I made um, on the novice program page, right? If you want to do exclusively, go ahead. Just change the variations as you become intermediate, you know, if you're doing concurrent. So you can do front box squat, high bar box squat, low bar box squat, zercher. You can do box squat with bands, safety bar squat, whatever you want. And you can even, um, you can throw in some free squats once in a while too, you know, nothing wrong with it. But hey, it's not mandatory to do a free squat. If you get better recovery, you prefer it, go ahead and do so, man. It's still a squat. You're still getting the benefits and you seem to be making extremely fast progress as well. Just make sure that's the correct height. A lot of guys that I see, they're doing uh, partial box squats because they're doing it off a bench, right? And because they're not too tall, it's like they're above parallel. So as long as it's the correct height of the box, you know, you should be good. And I forgot to mention, you could always change the heights too to override a biological accommodation. So no, you don't have to free squat. That's complete nonsense. What are your experiences with one arm dumbbell presses? Can they work well as assistant secondary presses? Yes, they can. But it depends what you're trying to do. Like in my experience, I didn't get a tremendous amount of carryover. I got stronger at the exercise. You see me do 100 pounds on my right arm. I've also done 90 pounds for reps on the left. The performance was there, but I didn't find that it raised my standard overhead press that much. It was a good mass builder, good strength builder. Like it was good. I liked it very much. And I still recommend it. If you're trying to get more carryover, maybe it's not the best choice. I mean, everybody's different. Just for me, it was not the most useful tool in raising the OHP, but... I can see beneficial in other regards, you know, like athletics and stuff like that. For fighters, it's good, you know, or just different types of athletes in general. So I think I still think it's a great exercise, but we got to ask, why are we doing it in the first place? Is it bodybuilding? If so, fantastic. Is it general strength training? If so, fantastic. 
But if it's carryover, I don't know. Try it out, see how it works out for you, bro. Everybody's different. Hey, Alex, do very high rep band face pulls have similar benefits to the shoulders, like band pushdowns for elbows? Thanks. I'd say so, man. In fact, um, I think that band face pulls are superior to cable face pulls. And I'll be making a video on that soon, giving you a full breakdown, okay? So look out for that video, but yeah, why not? You're getting the overspeed eccentrics, all the benefits of bands. Like, I don't see why this would not work. Squats three times a week, one peak set of 20 reps, warm up by doing sets of 10 from empty bar, adding weight every session. Sounds like fun. Yeah, it does sound like fun, man. And I have no doubt that if you ran this routine, you make all kinds of gains. For how long? I have no idea. Maybe you could use this as a um, short-term peaking cycle for high repetitions. Then you taper down to more um, 10 seat type approach. Or you use this first and then go straight into concurrent. And now you have a really solid base where you can maintain your volume year round, right? So I don't know why you're doing this, but definitely, definitely, definitely it's going to work. It's basically a 20 rep uh, squat program at this point. Some guys have tried this out every day, actually, adding five pounds of workout. Some have done it every other day, adding 10, like give it a shot. I think if you're able to recover from this and you're doing that peak set of 20 and you're actually adding the weights, you're going to get huge legs and you're going to get much stronger in the process. So. If that's what you want to do, that's your objective. Try it out, bro. Can deadlifts and leg press give you the same leg gains as squats and deadlifts? I wouldn't say the word same, but from a bodybuilding perspective, you're still going to get massive legs with uh, deadlifts and leg press. In fact, I'd recommend that you do leg press and RDL. To me, that's a more feasible combo from a bodybuilding perspective. Now, if you want to talk about leg gains, I would say squats and deadlifts are superior as a whole because we're taking care of more things. I mean, I think most of us can agree with that, right? From a strength building perspective, you know, general carryover. And, you know, if you get very strong squats and deads, like you're pretty much going to have a nice lower body as a whole uh, without any lagging areas. Like everything's holistic in a sense, right? But listen, bro, you don't care about that. You're not a competitive power lifter. Leg press and RDLs, you're going to get fucking huge legs. So you still get great gains. I just, I wouldn't say the same. I think it'd be absurd to say that it's exactly the same. No. What is the best way to progress? Dumbbell exercises, the five pound increments are too high as a novice, especially on dumbbell shoulder press. Mm, I, when you're first starting off, it shouldn't be problematic, all right? If you're doing like 30 pounds, no, you could do 35. The five pound jumps only become an issue when you're really getting up there in weights. Like for the dumbbell shoulder press, I would say around 65, that's when it gets more challenging. At least in my experience, that's how it was, right? Um, and then the, the dumbbell benching as well, when you're past 85, I would say, gets a bit more challenging. But honestly, it's still very doable. It's really the um, intermediates and advanced who have trouble with the five pound jumps, in my opinion. So the way that I see it, it shouldn't be a problem right now. But uh, if it is, for whatever reason, I would just encourage you to increase the repetitions. So if you're doing three sets of six to 10, up at the three sets of um, eight to 12, or three sets of 10 to 15. Um, in other words, increase the volume or just add extra sets as well. So instead of doing like three by 10, you could do a five by 10. So increase the volume a little bit more. And once you can get those high repetitions, and then you do the five pound jump, it should bring you back to a realistic amount where you can still do around six to eight or so. Um, so that's how I would do it. Just up the repetitions. And when you increase the weight, you're good. Very high reps, 100, 201 set, curls, extensions for forms. Um, some arm wrestlers do train like that, but I think a better way to do it is to split it up into four by 25 or five by 20 or three sets of 33, where you're still getting 100 total repetitions, but you've broken it up. Uh, that said, there's nothing wrong with the 100 rep sets or the 50 rep sets. Those are very effective. And if you induce progressive overload, you will get better, but it is more specific towards building up endurance regardless of the progressive overload factor. But hey, it does work. Like I've talked about this before in relation to rack pulls and getting bigger traps, transcendent training, right? So you can do that if you want to, but I would encourage you to do four by 25 instead, okay? Oh yeah, and also for the neck, it works pretty well. Just saying, reps of 100. I know that's how Mike Machine Bruce got his best results, doing reps of 100, three sets of 100 actually. But um, sets of 200 and 300, eh, I wouldn't fuck with that, bro. I would just say 100, you should tap out of that or just break it up so you're still getting 100 total reps, but it's, you know, divided. What do you think about concurrent periodization for teens? Nothing wrong with it, bro. It's a periodization style. That's all it is. Some teens use a linear, and then some guys, they just stick to basic linear progression until they no longer make gains from that, and then they switch to concurrent. Like, how strong are you? What's your experience level? If you're 17 years old and you're benching two plates for reps and you plateau from a basic novice routine, then yeah, you're ready for concurrent. Or hell, if you're even weaker than that, let's say you got a, I don't know, 185 bench, and you want to do concurrent. It's totally doable. You just got to manage volume intensity the proper way and use basic variations. It works for all experience levels, regardless if you're a teenager or not. Actually, I would say that teens are going to plateau much quicker on a linear progression system just because their body's not fully done developing. So that way, periodizing earlier might be a good idea. Of course, waiting until you've milked those gains in most cases, although you can start sooner, but I'm just saying it's a great idea. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. And that's what I would have done back in the day. 
had I known this information earlier. What's your opinion on doing back offsets after your max effort lift? Like if you did a one rep max, then three by five with 80%, three rep max, three by eight, five rep max, three by 10, the back off, the same exercise, the max effort, that's perfectly fine, bro. Uh, you see me do this in my training videos and in Ashley Enhanced, I do prescribe this in some cases. So you do your one rep max, then two to three back offsets. Like it's a classic strategy, it's time tested, it works. What do you want me to say? Go ahead and do so, my friend. Um, in fact, in many cases, it can replace secondary press. So three sets of five at 80%, that's pretty fucking effective, not gonna lie. Like actually, what I used to do a lot back in the day was um, one rep max bench, then I would throw on the um, slingshot and do some more one rep maxes, and then I would either take off the slingshot and just do raw sets right after, or I would just keep the slingshot on and do um, more back off sets, if you will. The only thing I'm gonna tell you is that if you're doing the back off sets right after max effort work, try to stick to low repetitions, you know, so not going above eight to 10, like that's the max that I would keep it at. But um, I would say triples and fives are really, really good. Or just staying in the six to eight rep range. Um, that's fantastic. Do you ever have bad workouts? Like when you're kind of tired and even the first set is a struggle, what do you do about it? Of course, everybody has bad workouts. Um, the key is to make sure that you don't get them that often. And the best way to do this is to run a really good system where you're managing all the variables the proper way. While of course, eating enough food and sleeping properly and managing the stresses in your life. To me, if I'm not recovering properly, usually it's because I didn't eat enough food or I was sleep deprived as fuck. Something happened that day and I just didn't sleep well. And then when I go train, I'm like, eh, I don't feel 100%. And in cases like that, I might not do the max effort method. I might just do a three sets of one at 90%. So you calibrate the training accordingly. You don't have to go balls to wall always, even though that is very effective, right? So the key is to prevent this from happening in the first place. But what do you do when you have a bad day? You don't feel recovered, whatever, well, you take your naps, you have a bit more caffeine, right? You try to eat a lot for that day. And then you show up and you give it your all. You know, you show up regardless, regardless how you feel, bro. Or you just take a day off, go the next day, you know? Like, it all depends on your program, how flexible it is, all that. Like on a percentage-based system or something where it's like really calculated beforehand, it might be a bit more challenging. But in my experience, falling concurrent, like, it's pretty easy to manage all the variables. Like, volume day, intensity day. And you just play by how you feel in many cases. So it's like... All I will say is um, it's normal, it happens to everybody, but try to make sure that you don't feel like this in the first place. Like it shouldn't be your default. I would say nine out of 10 times, you should feel good to do a workout. If you have a shitty session once in a while, so fucking be it. There's always next time and you'll do good then, okay? Just don't get discouraged. It's a long-term journey. And sometimes uh, we will fail, you know? The key is to get back up and not let it break you down, okay? Hey Alex, I've been training for four years and my body has lost body fat everywhere else except my stomach. Any help with this thing? Stomach probably, they get smaller, man. Like measure your waist, see what the facts are, you know? I would say that you probably recomped, like you lost body fat and you gained a lot of muscle or you didn't lose that much fat, but you gained so much muscle mass that you look leaner from an illusion perspective. But I would say you probably did lose some fat, but just not a significant amount. It's more so the fact that you got a bunch of freaking muscle. You probably gained your 20 pounds of muscle and possibly even more. So right now you're jacked, you have a really good physique, Maybe even bear mode right now, I don't know. But you look leaner, right? Like that's just the way it works. That's why the, the solution to being skinny fat is getting more muscle. It's not getting leaner, otherwise you get skinny ripped. So that's what I want to envision. You're probably bear mode, you probably look fucking swole, but you got some gut action. And maybe you're a little bit delusional on your stomach not losing weight. But that said, I will say that it's usually the last place to come off, you know? So you can have definition elsewhere. You can have nice arms, pecs, everything, but you can still have a bit of a bulge, man. That's how your fat distribution is. And most people, you got to get even leaner. So my advice for you is start cutting. You're jacked, man. It's been four years. Congratulations. Um, reveal those six-pack abs, you know, if you want to. Or if you don't, whatever. Like, for you, it's going to be the last place to come off. That's just what I believe to be true. And I think most would agree with me on this one. So just get leaner, my friend. There's nothing to worry about. I can't do a single pull-up because one, I'm weak, and two, I'm kind of overweight, around 25% body fat. I'm currently on a calorie deficit, losing fat and recomp. We think is a better way to build up pull-up strength, assisted pull-ups using machine or bands or doing negatives, or is there a better way other than those two? Well, I actually made a full uh, pull-up tutorial you could check out. I show you all the best exercises for getting into this, right? But I would say in your case, um, you're probably higher than 25% body fat without even realizing it, maybe you're 30 or more. And the fact that you're cutting is probably the most important thing you can do. So get lean as hell. Uh, that's gonna help tremendously in being able to do those uh, pull-ups, you know? So you might actually notice right now that as you lose the weight, it gets easier and easier. And then of course, um, due to negatives and the isometrics, um, check out my video that I did on this uh, subject, right? But 
I would say the assisted pull-up machine is the least beneficial, in my opinion. And then the bands, like, I'm not a huge fan of it, even though I do talk about it in my pull-up guide, right? So I think you'll get more from the negatives and the isometrics, to be honest with you. But if you really want to do the bands, like, go ahead. But I say if you get lean enough and you follow the tips in that video, you should have no problems whatsoever. So I would generally say negatives and isometrics. And then I would say bands are next and assisted pull-up at the final. But I, I, I don't like those two methods that much, just being straight. All right, last question of the week, guys. Hey, Alex, I've hit a huge plateau in pull-ups. I cannot get past 5x5 five five at 25 pounds. And my all-time best is 13 strict dead hang pull-ups. I've been stuck at this for about four months. I'm 6'4 at 225. Okay, two things I'm going to tell you to do. Number one, it sounds to me like you're running a minimalist routine because you just mentioned 5x5. Five five. Like, it sounds like you haven't experimented with different uh, training styles. Maybe you've been doing a linear progression, just trying to add weight, and uh, you just you can't do it at this point, right? Um, I would say... If you really want to milk the gains a little bit more, get into micro-loading. Just get some really small plates, um, attach it to a loading pin if you want, or just with the chain, standard method, right? And try to go a little bit more. You should be able to micro-load and get more linear gains, okay? If that doesn't work, though, or I'm assuming it will, but temporarily, just start changing up the variables, bro. I would strongly recommend concurrent periodization. We have an intensity day and a volume day. So maybe... One workout, you could do your three by threes or just a lot of triples and fives. Then the other session, you're doing rep work. So you can do 13 dead hang, right? Well, try three by 10 touch and go, add from there and then change the variation. So you're going neutral, underhand, regular style, wider, pausing, no pausing, right? Constantly mixing it up. And that's gonna allow you to get stupid strong. You're not gonna have plateaus. Take it from me, bro. I did 165 pounds on the pull up and the chin. So that's what I recommend, concurrent periodization, bro. And you can check out my full body workout videos or my upper body segments. I show you how it's done. At least those are some examples, you know. And try to do more than 5x5, five five, okay. Different sets of reps. And finally, I'm going to tell you to do grease in the groove, okay. So get yourself a pull-up bar or go outside and just do pull-ups as frequently as you can. Check out my video on high-frequency pull-ups and push-ups. I give you some very good insight on how to do this effectively without impeding your recovery. So I think you will overcome this. Keep in mind, you are six foot four at 225, so that is a bit of a barrier in the sense that there's more range of motion and you're at a heavier weight. But hey, I've seen some six foot five calisthenics athletes with crazy fucking numbers on weighted movements. So I think you still got it. It might be a little bit more challenging, but you will succeed if you do things the proper way. I know you could do it. Trust in yourself. You fucking got this. And try out these tips, man. So that said, hope you guys enjoyed this Q&A video. Post more questions down below, and I'll see you in the next one.